Good afternoon. See, it's not completely thankless. Every now and then you get a, an award or a round of applause, so it's not always thankless, Mr. Pointer, but it sure does feel like it at times. Uh, thank you all for having me here today. I want to thank uh, Alliance for Life and all the work you all do, um, the board, obviously, staff of Right to Life, uh, pardon me, not Right to Life, Alliance for Life. The, um, there are a lot of, a lot of pro-life groups. Um, I, I want to uh, thank Mr. Kenlin. Appreciate your service on the board and the donors who help make this organization work. Uh, it would not exist without uh, financial support. These are not easy things to do. Um, and they're time consuming and they're expensive. So your financial support of Alliance for Life is, is very much appreciated. Uh, Father, thank you for that wonderful uh, prayer. As a Catholic myself, probably m one of the most rewarding phone calls I got after this session were from my Catholic priest, uh, my bishop, my retired bishop, even priests who moved off to Cal uh, pardon me, Colorado, who used to be my priest growing up at uh, St. Anne's and Kelly, calling me to thank me for this session. And so that, to me, uh, makes, makes me feel like this job is worth doing, uh, you know, in the future. If, you're, uh, if your priests who know all your sins call you <laughs> and uh, tell you how much they appreciate the work you did um, this session, I, um, I, had a, uh, I had surgery recently on my, uh, on my nose. I had to put it off because of all these special sessions, and I had a... Uh, had two black eyes last week, and people were like, my goodness, are you okay? I said, this is what happens when you spend 87 days in special sessions, and you come home to your wife, she rewards you with two black eyes. And so uh, I took some time off uh, doing this type of, uh, these types of events, uh, and uh, I grew out of this beard. I haven't grown, I've not, not shaved in seven years since I first ran for office. And um, I see all this white stuff right here. <laughs> and that's what you get for 87 days in a special session, too. You start going gray. But truthfully, the 87 session was one for the record books. I, uh, I'm a former staffer. I'll talk about a little bit of that later on. But I, I have spent many years uh, in the political world before I went back home. I've been doing real estate for 16 years with my brothers, but... I was a former House staffer, former Senate staffer. I worked in the United States Congress. And so I have, uh, I've been around the block a few times, and I've never seen a session like this, quite frankly. And it's the reason why I went into extra innings, so to speak. It was, it, we had to get it done. It was the right time to do it. All the stars were aligned, and we were not going to take our, our foot off the gas. It was, uh, it was time to finish uh, the priorities of the House and Senate and governor, and we did that. It was a, a very conservative session. Some would say the most conservative session ever. That's for folks like you to decide. I will say that uh, when it came to accomplishing the pro-life agenda, it was definitely a very, very impactful and successful session. If you recall, in the 86, we passed the Born Alive um, Infant Protection Act, and which stated if a baby were to survive an attempted abortion, that physician must make every effort necessary to save the life of that baby. And at the time, just like this past session, we made headlines across the country. And we, we were the ones being called inhumane here in Texas for passing something that is, to me, a no-brainer, something that is common sense. And uh, as states like New York were repealing the protections of a child that was born alive, we were here protecting it. And that, that was seen as, again, inhumane from those outside the state. But for us, it was common sense here in Texas. And quite frankly, that was bipartisan. Like some of these other bills I'm going to talk about, they were actually bipartisan because they're the right thing to do. And so we continue to build upon that momentum, and we carried it in to this last 87 session. And like Mr. Poyman said, um, we had, we had success across the board. We uh, banned the mail order drugs that were proliferating across this state. And quite frankly, <laughs> at the time, I thought that may be the most impactful bill 
because we did not know how the heartbeat bill was going to make, it way, make its way through the court system. Uh, we passed legislation banning physicians from providing abortion drugs to a woman who's been pregnant past seven weeks. Another chipping off and chipping away at Roe v. Ro Ro Wade, trying to do all we can here in the state of Texas legally to make an impact and to save the unborn. We appropriated the most money ever to the Alternatives to Abortion program. It was $100 million. And for those of you who work in the CPC world and the crisis pregnancy, so thank you for your work. That is, that is um, you're in the trenches and you making a day-to-day -day difference. Uh, and as CPCs continue to grow across the state, you know, you will see, you know, the impact of the A2A program and the naysayers who say it's, it's not impactful. It doesn't do what you say it does because they're not seeing the work. They're not seeing what you see on a daily basis. They choose to ignore the successes. And that's, that's the, that's the detriment of, of them and their constituents. But those of us who support A2A and knows what it does for the state of Texas, it's boots on the ground. And so when I worked for Senator Williams back in the early 2000, that's when we first established the Alternative Abortion Program. Tommy Williams, my boss, I was a staffer on, a, on, on the finance committee. He was the one who created it, along with Alliance for Life and others. And he, that was the first, I think it was like $7 million at the time. It was something, you know, it was just far cry from $100 million, right? But I was there staffing it. I knew, I knew and, and I worked with Mr. Poyman back then. And uh, we, you had less gray, I had less gray. But uh, it was uh, it, that was monumental legislation. It wasn't easy to do, even a seven million dollars. And the argument against it then is the same argument that's that they're making now. And again, it's, it's they choose not to um, believe the successes of the program. Also, when I worked for Senator Williams that same session, we worked on the Women's Right to Know Act, and that that required a twenty-four hour waiting period. It required a pamphlet for the pregnant mom to go through and understand the dangers and the risk associated with having an abortion. And it also outlined all the different programs that were available to, to that mother should she choose to have the child, like the CPCs and others. And that I had to actually go as a young, young man. Uh, I was in my 20s, and I had to go down to the Department of Health and sit down with the bureaucrats and write that pamphlet, knowing nothing about the childbearing process, know nothing about being a pregnant mother, but, you know, you can pass laws and you can pass bills and amendments all day long. It doesn't mean much until the agency goes to write the rules. That's where all the work gets done, and that's when what you pass doesn't look like what you pass. Many of us come back every other odd year and go, wait a minute, that's not the bill I passed. That's not what we voted on because the agency decided to do something different. So we weren't going to let that happen with the Right to Know Act. And so I was sent into the trenches to deal with bureaucrats. Quite frankly, they were holdovers from the Ann Richards administration, if you can imagine that conversation, and make certain they were doing exactly what the legislature um, envisioned. And, uh, you know, thank you. And I do, I do, I remember one, one specific, I'll never forget this because I had it already teed up on video on my laptop to make, because I knew they were come, come at me with an argument. They didn't want to put in the, the higher risk of cancer following an abortion that had, that had been scientifically proven. And of course, they had, they had, they had uh, studies that, that dispel that. Well, you know, I think this, this, you, you saw the right to know that there is a risk. And whether you agree with this study or not, there is a risk like anything else. And they actually have that, just to get on a tangent here, they had that risk already in a pamphlet given to minors. But they didn't have it. Minors would come in for rape or incest, for instance, and, the, and they already had that verbiage in the minor pamphlet. They didn't want to put it in the adult pamphlet. They were already handing it out at the Department of Health. So but, but there was an exchange in between Dr. Duell, Senator Duell at the time, and Tommy Williams about that specific provision and Dr. Duell had all his homework done. And anyway, it was obviously legislative intent. It was in the record. And I said, well, let's just, let's just watch this video real quick. You know, that's when I walked, you know, walked down, got something to drink, came back and said, okay, y'all want to, 
you want to go ahead and put that in there or not? Yeah, I think that may be legislative intent. They may have discussed that. So the fight happens at the agency level, uh, you know, and, and quite frankly, that's why you have to have good staff because when we leave, when we leave Austin, Texas, you have to have somebody that stays on top of the agencies and makes certain they're doing exactly what we want. And that's why it's important to have organizations like uh, the Texas Alliance for Life because when we leave town, they're here as well, making certain that everything we worked on actually gets accomplished. So that was, uh, that's going back. I'm sorry. That was going back to time machine. All right. Back to today, uh, the heartbeat bill. 13 other states going in a session that tried to do the heartbeat bill and 13 states had failed. It, it, it either got close to the governor's desk or it got vetoed or it got held up in the court system, but no other state had, had enacted a successful heartbeat bill. Texas did it different this year. We, we went outside the box and thought differently about how we could implement this bill. And I think it's important, whether it was struck down or not, it was important, I think, for Texas to have a strong debate about pro-life issues. We have not done that at the macro level across the state. Now, in Republican Party politics, of course, we talk about it all the time. But for those swing voters, those independent voters, and even conservative pro-life Democrats, we have not had a big discussion in, in, in many years. And it's good to have those debates because you kind of find out where people are on the issue. And what we found out with the heartbeat bill is it attitudes towards abortion have changed. They've changed quite a bit over the last 50 years. And I think it is um, – it's very telling when you look at the polling and, and, and you look at public sentiment about the heartbeat bill and what it means. They may have objections to certain provisions within the bill, but the overall goal of the legislation, the vast majority of Texans agree with. And it crosses all demographics. Even, you know, the youth vote, who apparently, you know, does not view abortion like maybe an older, more conservative voter. That's not the case. It's not the case at all. And so it was interesting to have that debate in, in, the, in the public arena. And, of course, the heartbeat bill has, is, is the law of the land. And, you know, so 2,000 babies every single month are saved in the state of Texas because of the heartbeat bill. And then since in my time in the legislature, I'd say over the last six to eight years, abortions have declined by roughly half. In the state of Texas, even before the heartbeat bill. That's, that's tens of thousands of Texans who will be your next teachers, your next doctors, your next engineers, hopefully not your next politicians, but that, that is important. And I tell you, it is, um, it's every demographic. It's every child of every color, every religion, is going to be protected underneath the heartbeat bill and all this legislation we pass. And like the, 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 you know, the main legislation too that kind of oversees all this and kind of wraps it all up in a nice bow is the, what I call the trigger bill, which means if Roe v. Wade is overturned and overturned soon, then Texas takes control of its own destiny immediately. We don't even have to be in session. But something that, you know, that is near and dear to me and may set me apart from other Republicans, and that's fine because we're all different. I don't expect us to be all homogenous, you know, lockstep, purity tests. If my wife and I agree 80% of the time, that was a pretty darn good week. And the 20% we disagreed, I am apologizing profusely. <laughs> but I don't expect us all to be the same. That's, that's what makes us great. That's why we have debate. But, you know, if we're going to be protecting life in the womb, we need to protect it all the way to the tomb. It needs to be a, a wraparound. So I, I, have, I have a, I'm not going to get off on my criminal justice reform kick because we could be here all day. I'm not going to get off on all my health care reform because we could be here all, all night. But two things I want to talk about, and it's not something Republicans typically talk about, and that is health care options. And so here in Texas, if you are a, a young woman and you want to have a baby, we, we, we keep you on Medicaid for two months after that child is born, and then you're off. And postpartum and many of the health issues that occur after a, a baby is born is not evident in the first 60 days. 
even if it is, you you lose treatment after 60 days here in Texas. We're one of the sten- we were one of the stingiest states in the country. So we rolled out a bipartisan bill to extend that program to 12 months. If you are going to approach in, in, in you know, the CPC world, for instance, if you're going to approach a young mother and say, have a child, we will be there for you. We will, we will make certain you have the health care. You will have the support network, especially a, a mother at risk, an abusive, uh, maybe an abusive home. Maybe they don't have the, obviously the resources, the transportation. They don't have the knowledge on how to raise a child. Then we need to put our, our money where our mouth is. And we need to be the, uh, the biggest criticism from Democrats to Republicans who are pro-life is you only care about them until they're born. But well, that's not going to be the case here anymore in Texas. So, <laughs> the House's proposal was to go to 12 months. The Senate uh, didn't really move on the bill. We, it, I had to put a lot of my political chips in, into this particular um, push and one other in a second. But we we finally agreed to six months. So that's better than that's better than two. It's not as good as twelve. I'm not that great at math, but I do know that twelve is more long, longer than six. But it is still six months of quality health care coverage for a mother who decided life over death. And we that's something Texas should be proud of. <laughs> and speaking of that decision, we I think years ago, Texas purposely made it very difficult for parents to re- re-enroll their children in the children's Medicaid program. And we made the paperwork very difficult. And we made wellness visits to the point where I believe it was somewhere on the lines of, if I had a child, I would have to have my that child have a wellness check and re-enroll that child four times a year. So I have four boys, right? Uh, you know, that's, that's a lot of doctor's appointments. That's a lot of time off taking them to the doctor. That's a lot of paperwork. So what's going to end up happening with one of my four boys eventually, if not all of them? They're all going to roll off, and they're not going to have coverage. And children are generally healthy, very healthy, scary healthy. My children, I think, you know, maybe they're vampires at times. They cut themselves in the, in the, at night, and the next morning is gone. You are like, how did that happen? Um, they're just extremely resilient. And, and most of this is about wellness checks. It is about physicals. It's about keeping them. It's preventive health care. And again, if we're going we're gonna to tell families out there, you know, choose life over death, we can't turn our back on them when they're, they're at their most vulnerable. And so what we did is we streamlined that paperwork to now they only have to go through this twice a year instead of four times a year. And we're going to see how that works. Uh, there's accusations that there's waste, fraud, and abuse when you do that, and people are taking advantage of the program. We'll we'll just see. I, I don't think that's going to be the case because looking at other states who went to who who streamlined the process, they didn't see that type of abuse. But regardless, that's going to prevent about sixty thousand children each year from being rolled off their health care, and so we have a healthier next generation. And we're rewarding those families who chose life over death. And so you, we have we are working on the from the womb to the tomb here in the state of Texas. And it was previously mentioned that, you know, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, which actually started right here in the state of Texas. So Sarah Weddington, who was the attorney for Roe, was actually a college professor of mine. And a very nice lady, a very smart person. Um, I learned a lot from her. We didn't agree. We did not, we did not, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say we agreed 80% of the time. I wouldn't say we agreed 20% of the time. Um, but it's good to be challenged. It's good to go to college and have someone tell you everything that you think is wrong and, and you'd be able to push back. But I remember her telling the class that Roe v. Wade would uh, stand the test of time, and it would be the law of the land for her lifetime and for all of our lifetimes. And... I'm here to say I don't think that's going to be the case. Um, and again, I, I, I'm not a prognosticator on, on the Supreme Court. I just think the attitudes are changing in this country, and opinions of abortion are changing. And that's it's the will of the people. Just like much of the legislation that passed in this legislative uh, 87th was the will of the House, uh, I didn't have to twist any arms. I didn't twist any arms. This is what the body wanted. And this is, uh, and again, 
you know, some of these pro-life issues, we had Democrat co-authors and obviously Democrat votes as well. It was a bipartisan deal. And I think, you know, after this session, this, pardon me, this election cycle, we're going to have more Republicans. And if that heartbeat bill will be on the House floor this next, com- this next session, I mean, it could be almost a super majority that would have passed that bill. Now, who would have thought that? Uh, you know, eight years ago, we couldn't get a hearing on it. And here it is, not only the law of the land, but withstanding uh, judicial scrutiny. But I do think the reason we may see a change in Roe v. Wade is because the American people feel differently about abortion than they did 50 years ago. Thank you. I'm proud to say that uh, as as someone who is pro-life, you know, you come in, you get elected to the House and you, and you want to you want to vote on these bills, you want to pass these bills. But I'm just proud as my first term as speaker that I, I feel like Texas is not just one of the most pro-life states in the country. I think it is now the most pro-life state in the country. And, you know. It's always this big debate now. I don't know if it's presidential politics, but is Florida more conservative or is Texas more conservative, right? And I was like, well, Florida didn't have a heartbeat bill. And the governor of Florida said he didn't necessarily agree with it. He didn't have a pass. Florida didn't have constitutional carry. You know, Florida didn't do what we did on CRT. Um, you know, Texas, find a more conservative state in this country. And uh, you can have the rest of my coffee on that right there, but <laughs> it's not going to happen. I mean, there is no, there's no contest in, 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 my, in my personal opinion. Oh, also, we had a social media. I mean, I'm sure any of y'all probably put pro-life messages on your social media. You've probably seen it either throttled down or just not published or deleted, or maybe you went to Facebook timeout because of, pro, because of, because of uh, conservative, uh, you know, discursive posts or discussions or opinions. Well, Florida tried this and it was shot down in the courts, but Texas passed a, a social media bill that, that basically provides the same cause of action that you see in the heartbeat bill, but, but again, social, major uh, social media companies that are, that are censoring conservative thought that you have that same remedy. And so I think it's about, and it, it too has withstood judicial scrutiny. Again, Florida tried it. Get shot down. Texas tries it. It's the law. So I see a trend there. Um, as much as I like Governor DeSantis, um, you know, he, I don't think he can hold a candle to the state of Texas and Governor Abbott. Um, and, and one last thing I need to say is uh, it's, it, it, you know, we're still in the middle of a primary season. We still have some runoffs. And, you know, you can go up there. And pound your fist and say, it wasn't good enough. You didn't abolish abortion. And that's what we're hearing right now. If you if you if you have said we're going to pass the uh, trigger bill, we're going to pass the, the, the drugs through the mail bill, we're going to pass the seven-week bill, seven-week uh, abortion bill, and we're going to pass the heartbeat bill, some of these folks wouldn't have believed you. But you did all that. So now they're saying, well, you're not conservative enough. You're not Republican enough because you didn't outright ban it. Well, let me tell you what happens when you outright ban it. 2,000 babies each month die because that bill would not have lasted three minutes. The ink wouldn't be dry when the governor signed it before a federal judge would have thrown it out. And we wouldn't be celebrating 2,000 babies being saved every single month. And the last time I checked, there's nothing pro-life about administering the death penalty to a mother. It's important to have pro-life groups who get it, who understand uh, the path to victory and how you get to saving 2,000 babies. How do you get to the trigger bill to where if and when Roe v. Wade is repealed or overruled, then Texas has its own destiny in front of it. Um, it's important to have those groups, and, and, and the Alliance is one of those groups, your board, the donors. Thank you all. Um, you know, we got to keep going. It's not over until it's over, and uh, 
we're not finished. I'm not finished until every single single child, every single Texan is saved from the atrocities of abortion. So thank you all very much. I appreciate you. I think we, we do Q and A. God bless you all. Thank you.